All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. I hope everyone had a great Thanksgiving break. Uh, okay. Today, uh, I'm very happy to uh, have uh, you know a, a a former member of the CMU alumni, Dr. Anka Parak, who is right now a, a senior research uh, scientist at Google and also adjunct professor at NYU to give us a uh, industrial guest lecture. Uh, on his uh, very recent work on um, uh, high precision text generation. So anchor. No, thanks uh, everyone. So you can stop me whenever, uh, if you have some questions. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about something today that uh, our, our, our team works on um, at Google. Uh, and it's kind of an increasingly important research topic these days uh, in natural language uh, processing. So, the general topic of this of this lecture is on text generation. So text generation is a sort of a structured prediction task where you're given a source sequence X, which has uh, S tokens, X1 to XS, and your goal is to output a sequence target Y, which is Y1 to YT. Uh, in the real world, uh, this has a lot of common practical applications like translation, where you have a sentence in one language like English and you want to translate it to a different language like French. Uh, you can also have summarization, where X is a document, or even a set of documents, and Y is a one-paragraph summary, maybe, of, the, of all, all of this uh, information. Or data to text, where X is some sort of structured data, uh, which we'll talk about like a table, uh, and Y is a textual description of this, of this structured data, like which could maybe be a spreadsheet or a Wikipedia table or something like that. Um, and the high level of view of how people tend to solve these things uh, these days uh, with neural networks is that you have some sort of encoding function f that encodes x into a um, a set of, uh, a set of vectors c and the encoder is some neural network um, which we won't really discuss the details of in this talk uh, but it could be some recurrent network or some transformer or, so, or attention-based model or something like that. And then conditioned on this dense representation of X, which the neural network has outputted, um, you basically have a conditional language model, which is called the decoder, which is another neural network that given the previous tokens of the target um, that it's produced and given the, um, uh, the C, which is the encoding of the source, it learns how to produce the next token uh, in the sequence, or it models the next token. And this is some visual description of, of translation, where here uh, we've taken uh, a source sentence um, in German, and you can see that it's been, this, this meaning of this sentence has been encoded using this neural network into these, uh, into these vectors. And now we have some encoding of the source, which is this blue, and then this helps feed into the decoder, um, which is these, which is this green model. So given this blue, um, it it helps influence. Um, it conditions on the green uh, to help produce the green dense representation and the target tokens. Um, and I think for the, for this talk, the exact details of how this works is not super important. Um, we're going to talk about problems that are kind of invariant uh, to the underlying architecture and appear uh, in, in regardless of the type of architecture you use in, in, in these models. So what people have shown in recent years is that this strategy of generating text this way is incredibly fluent. Um, you can build very, very big models. Uh, if you've seen things like OpenAI GPT-3 or things like that, which are very giant language models, uh, which can generate kind of entire paragraphs that sound very coherent, uh, but the models are prone to hallucination, um, which makes them unsuitable for a lot of real world applications. And we'll define what hallucination means uh, on the next slide. And what we're gonna talk about this in this talk is that how the hallucination is caused by different problems, uh, which can be not just in models, but also in data and evaluation. And we'll propose ways of, of solving these problems. Um, and I think, uh, okay, so hallucination is basically when models generate phrases that are unsupported or they're contradictory to the source data. 
So here, um, this is a paper uh, from Harvard in 2017. And you can see that the goal of this task is you get a table of statistics from a basketball game, and you want to generate the summary for this game. And so here, um, you can see the what the neural model produces is on the right. And it sounds very coherent if you ignore the colors, right? It talks about who won the game uh, on Wednesday, uh, where they played, what happened in the first quarter, then maybe what uh, happened with different points and rebounds and things like that. Uh, but when you actually study the actual pieces of information, you see that many of them, which are all the ones highlighted in red, are contradictory to the source table. So the Jazz did not defeat the Rockets. Uh, it was the other way around. Uh, the scores are also wrong. The, the model mentions a phrase like the Rockets were able to out-rebound the Rockets 49 to 49. It talks about them having an advantage in front of their home crowd, which is not true, uh, and, and lots of things like that. Or uh, that the Jazz were led by Derek Favors and James Harden, but James Harden plays for the Rockets. He doesn't play for the Jazz. Um, and you can imagine that even if a model does this, you know, 10% of the time, it's unsuitable for a lot of real world for a lot of real-world applications, right? And um, this has kind of been a main challenge in getting neural models adopted uh, in, in many kind of real-world tasks. And so uh, uh, this is not just limited to this data set. Uh, here we see uh, this is a, um, a task called Wikibio, where you get a Wikipedia info box of a person and you need to generate a one sentence description of this person. And you can see that uh, the model has hallucinated that Frank Lino is a criminal defense attorney, uh, whereas his occupation is actually not stated uh, in, in the source. Um, so there are many reasons of why models hallucinate. And the first reason is actually very simple. It's just in the data. So in kind of our effort to build bigger and bigger models, we need more and more data. And the way we collect data sets is often very noisy. Um, and this is not often something we consider kind of in core machine learning, but it's uh, important once um, we're trying to build models uh, for, for certain real world tasks. And so here, for instance, in Wikibio, the way the data has been collected is that I got 100, uh, the, the authors got 100,000 or 500,000 examples which is a lot of data, but it's all very noisy. What they did was they basically took the info box and the first sentence of the Wikipedia page and pretended it was the target. And you can, you can see that the first sentence of the Wikipedia page often talks about lots of things that are not in the info box. So here, um, this person, uh, Frank Lino, it, it's true that he's a Sicilian American capital regime in the Bonanno crime family, uh, but this is not something that's ever supported by the source. So when the model only sees the source table, uh, it has no idea how to produce uh, these other phrases, and it kind of is encouraged to hallucinate. Uh, the other issue is evaluation. When you study classification, or even kind of tasks like sequence tagging, there's a clear gold um, target to produce, and so it's very easy to measure accuracy. Uh, this is not true in generation, right? So in generation, I can have sequences that have different parts of information, that have different synonyms, different other things, um, phrases that still make the, the, uh, the generated target correct. And typically what people have used in the past is blue. Uh, blue is a kind of n-gram overlap based metric. So blue will basically take the reference and the candidate and measure n-gram overlap and kind of heuristically determine a score. And this is what people have been using for a long time, uh, despite its simplicity. And what you can see is that blue kind of favors hallucination if the hallucination is very close to the gold label. right? So here, the reference is about Michael Dahlquist as a drummer in the Seattle band Silkworm. And the candidate is that Michael Dahlquist was a drummer in the California band Grateful Dead, which overlaps a lot of engrams. And the candidate is the same length as the reference. Uh, or almost the same. And so it gets a very high blue score, even though it's outputting wrong information. Candidate two is actually correct, but because it's a more conservative estimate and it's a much shorter than the reference, uh, blue uh, doesn't like that. It has uh, based on the formula that computes it. And so it gives it a lower blue score, even though candidate two is better than candidate one. 
Um, and candidate three is even better than candidate two because it has more information and has higher recall. But it just happens that the information it's including is not information that was in the table. It's talking about where Michael Duckwist uh, was from um, as opposed to the band he's in, uh, which is also good information. Uh, but Blue also doesn't like having different information than what the reference has. Um, so when we use kind of flawed evaluation metrics, we also encourage models to hallucinate because people uh, hill climb on these metrics and basically report kind of models that have the best blue. And um, the loss functions like maximum likelihood are also not useful to stopping hallucination because the way this loss looks, right, is that I'm giving, I'm measuring the probability of the gold target, phi, given the source x. And so if we decompose that into uh, this product on the right, we see that I'm trying to predict the best yt given the previous gold yt and the x. And since it's a probability, if I, um, I basically need to do the best I can to maximize that, that the gold token's probability, even if maybe I don't have enough information to generate that. So the model is kind of being encouraged to guess because it has no ability to kind of abstain from just outputting a token, which is what it kind of in some sense should be able to do to be more robust. Um, so what we've been doing in this team um, uh, for the last two years uh, is that we've been working on this on this problem, uh, kind of from these three perspectives of data, eval, and models. Uh, we also have an orthogonal effort on machine translation, uh, which I won't uh, talk about in this talk. Uh, and basically, I'll just talk about one kind of one paper from each of these categories. Um, is there any questions before I? Move on. No. OK. Uh, I, have a, I didn't quite understand your point with the, uh, the loss function. Can you go over that again? Yes. So uh, sorry, I'm using loss. This is like the likelihood, right? So this is the data. This is each example x, y. And I'm maximizing the conditional probability of y given x. Uh, I guess there should be a log here. If you really want. And then uh, this decomposes in chain rule. So this is the, uh, you're maximizing the probability of yt given the previous y tokens and the source. And so uh, because it's like probability, right? Like you. You cannot ever, uh, if, I, if I let one of the tokens be zero, uh, if I say that, oh, I just don't want to guess yt, then this probability will be zero, and that will be bad, right? Um, so I have to kind of max, even if it's something that, for instance, here, this would be y, right? And this is x. And all of these tokens here actually cannot be inferred from the source. But maximum likelihood is going to make me try to guess all of these tokens, even if some of these tokens are not easily uh, are, are not able to be predicted by the model. I don't know if that. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, that, that helps a lot. Okay. So first, I want to talk about some data. Uh, I never built a data set before before I built this one, but I think it's a very interesting experience. So uh, and you can find this this data set is freely available um, at this link here. Um, and so what we present is a control generation task uh, to help us measure and study hallucination. And in our control generation task, we have a source uh, table. Uh, in this case, this table is about Robert Craig and his NFL football statistics. Uh, some metadata about this table, like the table title, the section title, and the table description, and a set of highlighted cells. And the goal of the task is the model ingests all of the source information, and it produces a one-sentence target description about the highlighted cells in the context of the table. So what we would say is that you can see that since the years that Robert Craig are played or highlighted, and the yards and the uh, his rushing yards and receiving yards, what we should be talking about is kind of his total uh, rushing and receiving yards over all of his seasons. Right, and so the gold target sentence is that Craig finished his 11 NFL seasons, 
So Craig and NFL come from the metadata. 11 comes from counting from 1983 to 1993. And then I get 8,189 rushing yards um, from uh, copying uh, the cell from the table along with its column header. And um, uh, similarly for the receptions. So you can see that the task uh, kind of is a mix of copying different parts of the table with doing some inference over the table structure, whether it's uh, counting um, kind of 1983 to 1993, or uh, it's kind of matching um, particular cells with their column headers, or it's interpreting what some of these column headers mean. Like the model has learned to expand kind of YDS to yards. And I want to, before I discuss how we built this data set, uh, I want to talk a little bit about why we wanted to build uh, such a data set, right? And so one of the reasons uh, I talked about is that a lot of existing data sets are very noisy, right? You have large scale data sets, uh, but because they were collected in this heuristic way, it's unclear if the hallucination is caused by modeling weaknesses or by data noise. So for instance, if we had clean data, would the model still learn uh, to hallucinate or would it not? And another idea that you can do is you can just get annotators to write sentences from scratch. Um, so they'll see the source data and they'll write a sentence from scratch. Uh, the problem is that annotators typically are not very creative. So they will just write kind of the easiest kind of formulaic sentence they can write. So they would just probably write like, Frank Lino was born in 1938 in Gravesend, Brooklyn, New York, United States. Right, and there'll be nothing, there'll be no kind of interesting language or variety that makes a lot of tasks challenging, right? And what we really want is something kind of like this, where we have this 11, which was inferred from you know, 1983 to 1993, which is not something an annotator would likely write from scratch. Um, and another, another uh, motivation that we have is actually in how we define the task. So if you define the task as summarization, like what this data set does here, um, it's not very clear how to evaluate it, right? Because given this table of statistics, there are many possible summaries I could have generated, right? And it's actually very subjective uh, which important pieces of information from the table are important in the summary. And different annotators uh, could come up with different uh, summaries that would be equally correct. Um, and this makes things very difficult to evaluate, especially with automatic metrics. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, you could make it a very controlled task. You could kind of fully specify some meaning representation, like a semantic parse, and then just make a model produce a fluent sentence from that. Uh, but typically, that's not very challenging these days to modern neural networks, uh, because they're already very good at producing fluent, fluent text. So our data set is novel in two ways. It's a controlled generation task. and we basically have these set of highlighted cells to give guidance to the model of what to generate. But at the same time as we've seen, the model starts to do inference about the larger table in order to actually get the gold set, the gold target. Um, and our annotation process is also uh, novel. We're basically going to ask annotators to iteratively revise natural sentences on Wikipedia. And this will allow us to preserve interesting language that you see on Wikipedia but it will allow us to clean the sentences so that they're faithful to the table with the revision process. Uh, and this gives us a data set of about 120,000 examples uh, of training examples with 7,500 dev and 7,500 test. And so to get these data uh, examples, we basically got a bunch of tables from Wikipedia. Uh, and there you can see they're about different types of topics and they have different schema, uh, which can make the data set more challenging. We then used word uh, heuristics, so like word overlap or hyperlinks, to find sentences that might be related to the table. So in this case, we have a table about Gabriel Becker, and we found a heuristic sentence we think um, uh, talks about this table. And the problem with this sentence is that, just like the wiki bio sentence I'd shown you, there's a lot of information that's not supported by the table. Uh, the table doesn't talk about that Gabriel Becker won the German under 23 100 meter title. Uh, it doesn't uh, talk about uh, that she was selected to run. Uh, there's nothing in the table about running. It could be that the relay is um, 
uh, about swimming or something like that. Um, and furthermore, uh, an, an additional complication is that since we've allowed any sentence from Wikipedia, the sentence is not standalone. It can have pronouns or things like that, uh, which is highlighted in blue. So what our annotators then do is they first have the table and the sentence, and they highlight all the cells that support the sentence. And so sometimes this is just uh, highlighting kind of the words that are in the sentence, like 1995 and World Championships. Sometimes there's some paraphrasing required or some inference. So here, individually in the sentence is supported by 100 meter uh, in the table, and relay is supported by four times 100 meter relay. Uh, and then the annotators basically clean the sentence and make it standalone. So they delete all the phrases that are not supported by the table. Um, and then they decontextualize the sentence by um, uh, replacing the pronoun with the proper noun Gabriel Becker. And then they do some grammar correction so that it's a complete sentence. And so doing this, we get this data set with 120,000 examples. Our target vocabulary size is about 136,000, uh, which is quite varied. Uh, and there's 83,000 unique tables. So there's um, some tables. Some some tables uh, have are associated with multiple sentences, uh, but it's a maximum of five. Uh, and we can see also here that the median number of cells per table is 87. So the tables are quite big, and if we didn't have any highlighting, it would be very unclear what to generate from these 87 cells. But when we uh, redo with the highlighting, there's only about three highlighted cells per table. And so that makes the task uh, a lot more well-defined. Uh, and now we can measure some annotator agreement at every stage. So we can see that uh, after each stage, the agreement goes down, which is what you would expect. So after deletion, it's 82.9. Um, and it kind of gracefully degrades as you do more and more edits, because you could expect that annotators will defer more and more as the, as the process goes on. Uh, but still, this annotator agreement is pretty high. So if you just copy, if you compare the annotator with the original sentence, uh, the blue would be like in the 40s, uh, which is much lower. Um, we can see that our data set has uh, a variety of topics, as shown on the left. About half of the topics are sports and countries. And the other half are kind of more rare topics like literature, entertainment, et cetera. Um, and then on the right, we basically took 100 randomly chosen examples and manually annotated some phenomena. So we can see that 21% require reasoning. 13% um, require uh, comparisons across row, columns, or cells, uh, et cetera. Uh, so now I'll show you some baselines. Um, Kind of at a high level, the first one, BERT to BERT, is a pre-trained encoder decoder model, where basically, uh, if you're familiar with BERT or some other types of pre-trained models like GPD-2, you basically initialize the encoder and the decoder functions with BERT. Um, and so the model kind of uh, can adapt quickly. Uh, then pointer generator is a normal seek to seek uh, LSTM based model with a copy mechanism, which is pretty popular, uh, which is a pretty popular baseline in data to text before um, BERT to BERT. And uh, the last model is kind of a specifically designed model for data to text with content planning, uh, which was designed for RotoWire. And uh, we have three, we have three metrics, uh, blue, which is a standard engram metric, which I talked about. And then we've proposed two metrics in the best one is called parent, which is an n-gram metric uh, specifically for data to text, and um, blurt, which I'll talk about in the next session, so, which is a learned um, eval metric. Uh, and uh, with these baselines, you can see that the, all the metrics are completely, um, they rank everything similarly. Um, <clears throat> uh, it ranks the bert to bert model the highest, followed by the pointer generator, and followed by the, um, the content planning model. Um, you can check our, we have a leaderboard for this data set, and you can see that I think for the most recent submission, um, uh, the, the, the metrics don't completely agree. Um, we also did some human evaluation because no automatic metric is perfect for generation. And so we compute an Oracle upper bound, 
uh, basically our dev our dev dev set has three references for each example. We call out one of the references and pretend it's a model prediction and ask the human annotator to compare it with the other two, as well as the table. And we see that the Oracle is 99.3% fluent and 93.6% faithful. Faithful means that it's only uh, outputting information that's supported by the source. Um, so 100% faithful would mean there's no hallucination. We can see that the Bert to Bert model uh, is less fluent. It's 88.1% fluent. And it also hallucinates considerably more. The faithfulness is 76.2 versus uh, the Oracle of 93.6. Uh, and this answers kind of the one key research questions in this talk, the neural models hallucinate, even when you have clean data. And uh, in the next couple of slides, I'll kind of show you some examples of why uh, they still hallucinate on our data set, indicating that it's kind of a challenging benchmark. So, one, one area that models really struggle with these days is rare topics. So this table is about microdrives and about how microdrives have increased in capacity as the years have gone by. And we can see the reference output something very interesting, like a second generation of microdrive was announced by IBM in 2000 with increased capacities at 512 megabytes and one gigabyte. Uh, the model prediction on the other hand doesn't really understand this table uh, and this topic very much. So it just says there were 512 microdrive models in 2000. Uh, and so can we see that one, there's multiple kind of causes of hallucination here. One is the rare topic. And also the other is that the reference has some interesting inference, right? Like second generation or increased capacities. And these, these are things that are inferable from the table. But if the model doesn't learn the proper inference, uh, if, it doesn't, if it's not learning that, then uh, it won't understand, it'll just learn to guess or hallucinate instead. Um, and we see something, sorry? Uh, I thought someone was asking a question. Yes. Hello? I think someone unmuted themselves by accident. Okay. Um, we see here that um, the prediction here is correct. Uh, but it's very boring. It basically just copied the table cells. Uh, and it said, Kels finished the 20, 2012 season with 45 receptions, et cetera. Uh, the reference is much more interesting. It says that this was Travis Kels' last collegiate season, which you can infer from the, from the table, and that he had personal career highs uh, in reception, yards, um, yards per receptions, and receiving touchdowns. Um, yeah. So in summary, uh, this is our data set, and we would be like you to try it out. Uh, you can feel free to contact us if you have questions or suggestions. Um, okay, are there any questions before we move on to evaluation? No. Okay. Okay. So we talked about how we can clean data and how we can build more challenging benchmarks. The next question is how we actually evaluate these generation models. And this has become a topic that's become very interesting uh, to the research community recently because neural models are performing in a way that blue is no longer kind of distinguishing models uh, correctly. And we can see from this example why metrics would be a, gener a bottleneck to generation progress. Because depending on what you're actually looking for in the metric, you may have a different criteria, right? So here, in the first example, the prediction is just completely off from the reference. It's incorrect. The word overlap is low. You can expect that um, blue would give it a low score because it's just very far off from the reference. But in the second example, everything is right besides the numbers, right? Like eight is eight and six are correct, but uh, sorry, eight and six are what the model predicts but the reference has six and five, right? So blue would probably be a very high, give it a high score, but this is clearly wrong. So we wanna give it a low score. And the third example is actually subjective, right? Like both the prediction and the model are correct, but the reference is in some sense better, it's more informative. So we may want to have a metric depending on the application that kind of rewards um, references that are more, or predictions that are more informative. Um, 
And what has become exciting these days is to use learned metrics, which is kind of putting classifiers and metrics kind of on the same playing field, right? So you would also, to basically train your metric, you would have data, right, which is human ratings data. You would get human annotators to evaluate model outputs. And you would have data, and then you would uh, use kind of a standard transfer learning approach. Like maybe you would take a pre-trained, uh, a large pre-trained model off the shelf like BERT. You would fine tune this model on some human ratings data. And then you would have this kind of learned metric. And so now to evaluate your model, you would also be using another, uh, another model. Um, the problem is that this is brittle, and it requires a lot of this human ratings or fine tuning data for every new and data set and task that you have. And the advantage kind of of blue or, or of n-gram based metrics that people have been using in the past is that they're very easily portable to every task that you could think of. So here we talk about how to kind of help bridge this gap. So we still want to have an end-to-end -end metric, but we want a metric that has fast um, domain adaptation to other domains and is robust to train test queue. Um, that would make the metric robust over time. And what we propose is something simple. We propose to basically have a synthetic data uh, additional pre-training stage where we generate synthetic reference candidate examples that we think simulate what a model would look like, what a model would see, uh, along with scores, uh, which are also computed by various heuristics. And this builds a lot of representation knowledge. And then we basically fine tune it on some human ratings data. Uh, to get our final classifier. And we see that this, at least when it was published, it got state-of-the-art results on both uh, WMT, which is a machine translation uh, evaluation set, as well as WebNLG, which is a data to text uh, evaluation set. So the first question is how we would generate synthetic data. Um, and we want to generate pairs that resemble reference prediction pairs. So here I have a reference which is I bought soy milk from the store on Tuesday. And um, you know the right kind of shows typical errors a model would make. It may delete some words. It may replace kind of the day of the week with a, a similar but different day of the week. It may add some adjectives. It may have some repetition, like on Tuesday, on Tuesday. These typical errors are not found in existing paraphrasing data sets. So we can't just use some existing data set that exists. So uh, instead, we use synthetic data. And the way we generate synthetic data is we basically randomly mask text. So we uh, mask out you know, various words. And then we employ a pre-trained language model like BERT uh, to fill these masks. And you can see you can take random masks. You can also take contiguous blocks. And the other strategy we use is something called the popular in the community called back translation, where basically you can get a noisy paraphrase by taking an off-the-shelf translation model and you can uh, you you take an English sentence, you translate it to a different language, and then you translate it back, and you will get some uh, nice linguistic variation uh, usually by by doing this kind of uh, procedure, and so it'll get you this kind of noisy paraphrase. We then have a bunch of multitask signals uh, that we use for noisy supervision, so blue rouge bird score. Uh, which is another learned metric, entailment, which is um, a different NLP task, back transition probability, uh, a lot of metrics like this. Um, and we compute, uh, we, uh, we perform the pre-strain change. And then we uh, fine tune on the small amount of human range data that we have for, for the task or domain. And um, now what we can see is that Blur minus the synthetic pre-training, which is basically just doing the vanilla fine-tuning on the ratings data, already is actually state-of-the-art. Um, but when you add the pre-training, it goes up an additional two spearmen. And uh, this is this is a considerable gain, but not like very large. But once we stress test the model and sort of robustness and skew, we see that the synthetic pre-training really helps a lot. So what we do is we skew the training set toward lower ratings, which are worse predictions, and the test set toward higher ratings, which are better predictions. And we see if we only train the model 
on the skewed training set, which has lower predictions, if we can distinguish among higher predictions. And this is kind of important because you can imagine that metrics, you know, you want a fixed metric maybe over some time, like a year or two years, and the models are getting better in this time, right? So the the data you train the, the train the metric on has weaker models than what kind of more recent models would have, right? And we can see kind of a picture of this on the left where we have this skew factor. The skew factor is skewed the training distribution to the left, and it's skewed the test distribution uh, to the right. And on the right, we can see the effect of the pre-training. So blur, no pre-train, you can see that the blue, kind of the light blue to the dark blue is blurred under various degrees of skew. And you can see the performance decreases considerably as you increase the skew. Whereas on the right, you can see with pre-training, the model is very robust. So uh, except for the very large skew, which is the very dark blue, the model is actually fairly robust, and you can see the lines are clustered together. Um, this is a web NLG result where we see uh, on a different data set, we basically see how quickly a model can adapt to a different domain. Uh, and this is a little bit of a confusing of a picture, but if we look at the bottom right, we see that basically what's happening is, so there's two halves. The left half is where we created the train test split by system. We held out certain models or systems in training and tested on those in test. And the other way of splitting the data set is by input, so by the actual uh, reference. So the models can overlap in training tests, but the ex actual examples cannot. And we basically see that zero records here means that the model has not seen any training data for this task, right? So we can expect that blue, TER, meteor, these are all n-gram-based metrics. They perform the same regardless of how much in-domain data you have. But uh, in birth score, right? Um, blurt minus pre minus WMT is basically just like BERT out of the box, right? Because there's no ratings data, there's no fine tuning or anything. So that's the white and or the very lightest blue. You can see the performance is not very good. Once you add the synthetic pre-training, but you remove the WMT data, you see this is the light blue. You can see the performance is a little bit better. And once you see, uh, once you add the WMT data, uh, you get the full blurt, and you can see that the model, even without any uh, domain-specific data on WebNLG, is already getting um, kind of tied with state of the art. And then as we move right in the graph we're adding more and more data, like 836 records, 1,400 records, 2,600 records. And you can see that all the BLURT models adapt very quickly, obviously, and get state of the art. Are there any questions about our metric? We encourage you to try this metric if you are um, working on any text generation problems. And let us know if you have any concerns or questions or shortcomings you've seen. Uh, are there any questions, or can I move on to the final portion of the talk? OK. Um, so last thing I want to talk about models, and this is a little bit more technical portion of the talk, uh, maybe than, than previous. Uh, this is work that's led by Ran, Ran Tian in our team. And um, we, I, I've, I've been showing you this example quite a bit. Here we have uh, this task to generate this uh, target sentence given the source info box. We see that the reference contains a lot of information that can be inferred by the source. The baseline hallucinates this person's occupation. What we would like to do is produce a correct sentence, right? A sentence where everything is supported by the source, even if it's a little bit more conservative than the baseline. And it's maybe shorter than the baseline. And it has less information. But everything we want it to say should be correct. And I want to give you some intuition as to why this model hallucinates. So 
our intuition is that there's three types of tokens in the target sentence. There's tokens which are templatic words. They do not convey any source information. And if I train a language model on just the, the target without looking at the source at all, I would learn some of these patterns and learn how to generate some of these words, right? Like all people are born at a certain time and the model always uses born, you know, after the name of the person. And other, other words like is uh, and commas and things like that. On the other hand, content words, which are faithful to the source, require the model to attend and pay attention to the source and use source information to generate the target. Hallucinations are typically content words that are not closely associated with the source, right? So academic author and radio host are not things that an unconditional language model would easily generate, but they're, uh, and they're not in the source either. So what we wanna do is we wanna build a model that defines a per token confidence score that's high if the token is templatic, which is a, blue, a word that's blue, or is supported by the source, which is a word that's green. And the confidence score should be low if it's not a templatic word, it's not supported, uh, and it's not supported by the source, which is the red words. And so now the question is how we want to mathematically define the score. Um, so the blue one is easy. We basically just say the word is templatic if it has a high probability under base language model that's not conditioned on the source. So if we train a model just on the targets and we don't look at the source at all, and if the model can still reasonably generate these words, then they're considered templatic. The other one, the green one is trickier. So, and this kind of depends a little bit on the architecture that you're actually considering. Um, Basically, you can define this probability, yt given the previous tokens in x, as a softmax distribution where you basically take the decoder state at time t, at position t, you take a dot product with the embedding vector of the token, and then you normalize over all the possible options in the vocabulary. And is new t, we assume, is decomposed into a sum where a t is is the attention vector, it's a function of the source. If you're familiar with neural attention, this is basically a weighted average of the source states. Uh, and HT, which is kind of the decoder LSTM state, if you're using an LST. And I think the details don't matter so much, except that AT is basically a function of the source, whereas HT is not really a function of the source. I mean, it, it indirectly, indirectly depends on the source, but it's only kind of vaguely related to the source. And we're defining the attention score to be high if AT is a very high norm relative to HT, which means that the model is really using the source tokens to make the to influence the decoder state to make the prediction. And then we basically kind of take the OR of this, which mathematically is an addition, right? So the confidence score at position T is high if AT is high, or if um, the base language model scores high. And the issue is that this score depends on some learned parameters, right? AT is a function of the model parameters. This is also a language model. It's a function, you know, if you want to train it jointly, it's also a function of parameters. And we want to jo train it jointly with the rest of the model, and we also want to use it at inference time. I'm so and a, someone has a question. Uh, yeah. Siddhant, if you just want to unmute. Yeah. Hi, can you like explain the templatic word part again? I didn't got it actually. Yes. So, um, templatic words are like kind of uh, words that are. Let's say you had this language model here. You can see it's not conditioned on X, right? You're basically predicting YT given the previous Ys, right? So it'd be like predicting born given Michael Eric Dyson, right? And in this data set, it's all about people, right? 
and all the people are always like, it'll always talk about where they're born after their name, right? So the model doesn't ever need to see the table to be able to generate the word born, given the previous words. So it sees Michael Eric Dyson, it knows that what it should say next is born, regardless of what when this person was actually born. Similarly, once uh, it's done saying the date, it knows that it should output like a verb, like is or something, uh, because that's what all the other sentences in the data has, so that's what it knows what to do, regardless of what the actual source table says. Uh, does that make sense? Yeah, I get it now, yeah, thanks. Yeah, and this is in contrast to the other words, right? So October 23rd, the model couldn't generate just based on the previous tokens. It would have to look at the source to be able to know that it's this particular date that he was born. There's a chance that he would you would generate this date without looking at the source is pretty low, uh, given the number of possibilities. Okay. So now there's quite a bit of math here, which I will kind of just hand wave over. But basically, it's a little bit like EM, right? So you can imagine this confidence score is a bit like a latent variable. And if I knew what it was, then I could basically clean up the data to remove unsupported phrases. So if I knew that for the confidence score at every position, I could basically just know that these have low confidence score and I could remove them from the data. Okay, But I don't know because I'm training the confidence score with the model. So we do some sort of variational Bayes objective to kind of alternate between um, sampling confidence subsequences in training while learning the confidence score. Uh, and this is a bit like learning latent variables uh, in graphical models, right? So here, um, what we're doing first is that given the current iteration of the parameters, we sample a confidence subsequence based on the current confidence score to train on. So we have the sentence, and every we have a current confidence score at every position. We sample kind of a subsequence to keep, which in this case has decided to skip these three things, which have low score. And we have this sentence, and we train the model on this sentence as if it was the actual target. And then we use that to update the confidence score. Okay. And this is a bit like this is a bit like EM. Like you're alternating between the sampling and then between performing this uh, optimization. Uh, and we also have a calibration trick, which we got from Braverman et al., where basically you can have an additional term to the likelihood. So there's a normal likelihood term, but then you can have an additional term that calibrates probabilities. So here, in this additional term, there's nothing being, there are no parameters that are being learned except for this kappa. Everything else has a stop gradient. So there's no, the gradient is not passing through C or P or anywhere else. It's only passing on, uh, it's only being used on kappa. And you can see all of this confidence score is doing, it's reweighting the output probability distribution based on the confidence score. So it's kind of adjusting it a little bit. And when kappa is zero, that means that um, you basically re result to the normal, um, no, there's no modification. And typically, the model will learn a value of kappa that's not zero. Uh, so we have some experiments. Uh, I'll just show the wiki bio ones here. Uh, our model works with different types of, it's a method, like it's a decoding method. So it works with different types of underlying architectures. So we show how it works with pointer generator and with a bird encoder with an LSTM decoder. And then um, uh, we have some eval metrics. I'll focus mostly on human evaluation because that's the most accurate. So we can see that when we run the human evaluation on faithfulness, we consistently get more faithfulness with confidence decoding. So it's about here in the confidence for pointer generator moves up from 80 to 86. Um, and uh, it also, uh, for BERT to LSTM, it moves up from 75.6 to 79.4. Uh, this comes with some drop in blue because the model tends to output a shorter sentence, which Blue doesn't like. 
the fluency is kind of similar across all the baselines. Um, we, as I mentioned, we do get a minor coverage drop from this conference decoding because it's more conservative. So you can see that the uh, the pointer generator is 39.4% coverage, and the confident one is 37.8% coverage. Uh, but there are ways to basically alleviate that. You can use a length penalty to force the model to produce a longer sentence and have more coverage, uh, but this sometimes reduces the fluency. So there, there are always trade-offs. Um, so this is kind of the main topics I had for today. Um, and we talked about hallucination. We talked about solving hallucination in a multifaceted way from the perspective of data eval and models. Uh, and here are some links uh, for, the, for the things I talked about, uh, for the data set as well as the large. Uh, and thanks a lot for your for your time. Um, if there are any questions, feel free to about any part of the talk. Feel free to feel free to ask. Uh, I have a question on the uh, blurt. Uh, yes. So I'm curious how well the blurt score uh, transfers to like different domains or even different. Uh, like how can you adapt that score to say a different domain or a different language uh, when evaluating generation? Like, is it restricted to a high resource domain? Uh, no, right? So we have kind of, because of this pre-training, we have basically made it like, transfer learning makes things adapt fast with less data, right? So when you do more transfer learning with the synthetic data, you need less kind of in-domain data to be able to perform well. So typically, if you hand label a, a couple of hundred examples for your domain, it will transfer to that domain. I see. Um, language is different because language, uh, like if you use BERT, like the, the English BERT, and you also have English synthetic data, then you know it's not seen any foreign language, right? So that's pretty far off. So it can't adapt like that. We have we have multilingual versions of of Blurt uh, that we submitted uh, to WMT. I don't know if they're. I think they're not publicly available yet. But uh, yeah, we do have some uh, multilingual things in the works where you could evaluate text from different languages. Uh, the vocab is also a challenge with multilingual, right? Because you need to. Uh, not everything is with the English alphabet. So if it's Chinese or if it's Arabic or something like that, um, or, or Gujarati, like everything is different scripts. So I think you need to kind of have a model from scratch that works in those languages, and then you can adapt it to a, a given task. Um, yeah. I think another, another tricky thing is that Blurt doesn't look at the source, right? So Blurt only looks at, it's basically taking in a prediction and a reference to produce the score. Uh, and that's suitable for most tasks. But there are some tasks where you can imagine it's so subjective that you need to look at the source. And in those tasks, Blurt currently doesn't work. Uh, you would need to adapt it to use the source information. Uh, does that answer your question or no? Yeah, yeah, it does. Uh, okay. Definitely, I'll look for that uh, multilingual blur paper when it comes out. Yeah, we have. I, I can send you the, or I can. Uh, uh, it's called. Uh, it's called this one. Uh, yeah, it's called this one. Learning to value the trends of Jordan. It's in it's in WMT this one. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Are there any other questions before uh, we end this session? Okay, if not, I think we're done here. Um, 
thanks for uh, stopping by everyone. And again, uh, we really appreciate you coming by and uh, giving this talk to the class. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for having me. Uh